Please be seated in General Graves. Thank you, General Graves, for that very kind introduction. And Barbara and I are just delighted to be here and honored that we could be joined by our able Secretary of the Army, Mike Stone, and of course the uh, man well known here that heads our Army, General Sullivan, General Gordon Sullivan, and Gracie Graves, General Robert Foley, General Galloway, Sean Daniel, well known to everybody here, has been, been our host in a sense, and a West Point alum who has been at my side for four years out here somewhere General Scowcroft, graduate of this great institution who served his country with such distinction. And may I salute the members of the Board of Visitors. See another, I have to single out, General Galvin, who served his country with such honor. And of course, save the best for last, the Corps of Cadets. Thank you for that welcome. Let me begin with the hard part. It is difficult for a Navy person to uh, come up to West Point after that game a month ago. <laughs> Go ahead, rub it in. Uh, but I watched it. Amazing things can happen in sports. Look at the Oilers, my other team that <laughs> took it on the chin the other day. But, but I guess the morale of, moral of all this is that losing is never easy. Trust me. I know something about that. But if you, uh, if you uh, have to lose, that's the way to do it. Fight with all you have. Give it your best shot and win or lose. Learn from it and get on with life and I'm about to get on with the rest of my life. But before I do, I want to share with you at this institution of leadership some of my thinking, uh, both about the world you will soon be called upon to enter and the life uh, that you've chosen. Any president has several functions. He speaks for and to the nation. He must faithfully execute the law and he must lead. But no function, none of the president's hats, in my view, is more important than his role as commander-in-chief. For it is as commander-in-chief that the president confronts and makes decisions that one way or another affects the lives of everyone in this country as well as many others around the world. And I've had many occasions to don this most important of hats. And over the past four years, the men and women who proudly and bravely wear the uniforms of the U.S. Armed Services have been called upon uh, to go in harm's way and have discharged their duty with honor and professionalism. I wish I could say that such demands were a thing of the past, that with the end of the Cold War, the calls upon the United States would diminish. I cannot. Yes, the end of the Cold War, we would all concede, is a blessing. It is a time of great promise. Democratic governments have never been so numerous. What happened two or three days ago in Moscow would not have been possible in the Cold War days. Thanks to historic treaties such as that START II pact just reached with Russia, the likelihood of nuclear holocaust is vastly diminished. But this does not mean that there is no specter of war, no threats to be reckoned with. And already we see disturbing signs of what this new world could become if we are passive and aloof. We would risk the emergence of a world characterized by violence, characterized by chaos, one in which dictators and tyrants threaten their neighbors, build arsenals brimming with weapons of mass destruction, and ignore the welfare of their own men, women, and children. And we could see a horrible increase in international terrorism with American citizens more at risk than ever before. We cannot and we need not allow this to happen. 
Our objective must be to exploit the unparalleled opportunity presented by the Cold War's end, to work toward transforming this new world into a new world order, one of governments that are democratic, tolerant, and economically free at home and committed abroad to settling inevitable differences peacefully, without the threat or use of force. 